Strange new worlds, new life, new civilizations. Creator Gene Roddenberry's 1966 television series Star Trek and the wealth of shows, films, and much more that have sprung from it draw from an endless well of science fiction concepts that propel a humanist vision. As the crew of the Starship Enterprise and more galactic explorers encounter sci-fi scenarios that cause them to answer moral, philosophical, societal, and ethical questions which reflect the real world, Star Trek's speculative fiction inspires viewers to be better than they are and to grapple with the complex issues around them. While these elements and their applications would continue to evolve over the decades, they are all vibrantly present in the three seasons of Star Trek The Original Series. Here, Captain James T. Kirk, Commander Spock, Dr. Leonard McCoy, and the rest of the iconic cast of characters explore the galaxy on a five-year mission as part of Starfleet with numerous adventures that would help to define what Star Trek was throughout its many following iterations. However, the crown jewel among these 79 episodes may be one that is highly unconventional on its surface, yet contains the elements that are intrinsic to what makes Star Trek a powerful, lasting science fiction vision. It's writer Harlan Ellison's The City on the Edge of Forever, the 28th episode of TOS's first season, and one whose difficult production and haunting narrative would illustrate what the franchise's pinnacle could be and inspire countless stories in its wake. Despite being an episode that largely takes place away from space exploration and many of the familiar elements of the franchise, The City on the Edge of Forever is quintessential Star Trek. Its high-concept central conceit, use of character to provide humanist weight to sci-fi exploration, and thematic resonance that would tie into the core of the franchise make this a story that encapsulates the one-of-a-kind strengths which helped Star Trek remain relevant and unforgettable for more than half a century. And when combining the often cynical prophecy of Ellison with the inspirational humanist vision of Roddenberry, the result would be a tragedy that lingers in the minds of viewers all these years later. The episode sees Kirk and Spock chase Dr. McCoy to the surface of an unknown planet after the medical officer accidentally injects himself with a drug that causes paranoid delusions. On the surface of the planet, the crew discovers a sentient formation known as the Guardian of Forever, which can transport people to any place in time. While studying the occurrence, the delusional McCoy leaps through it and is transported back in time. Kirk and Spock quickly discover that whatever McCoy did in the past has had major repercussions, including causing the Enterprise to no longer exist. All that you knew is gone. To correct the time stream, Spock and Kirk travel back to stop McCoy's unknown actions, putting the plot of the city on the edge of forever into action. It's admittedly a convoluted setup for a fairly simple premise, undoing time travel mistakes no matter the cost. Putting McCoy into a place of rash action and establishing the stakes and rules of the episode are somewhat unwieldy, although they are in service of exploring grander ideas. However, the rocky road toward the episode's completion can illuminate why its opening structure is as tortuous as it is. Despite being the second to last episode of the first season to air, City began development before the first episode of Star Trek even premiered. Series creator Roddenberry had hired Ellison as one of the first writers for Star Trek, hoping to add his talents to the in-development show after Ellison had been nominated by the Writers Guild of America for his Outer Limits script for Demon with a Glass Hand. Given free reign to develop his own episode idea via 10-page outline, Ellison crafted the story of the city on the edge of forever with many notable differences from what eventually aired. At the time, Star Trek was without a series bible, which would dictate the overall rules for the show regarding characters, story, world, and tone. As such, Starfleet was a more traditional military unit. The man who traveled to the past was a corrupt lieutenant taken to the planet for execution, the planet home to an ancient ruined city with massive aliens and the Enterprise now hosts to a band of renegades after time alterations. Although the exact details of what was in this original outline differ depending on who's telling the story. However, the script would mutate over time and remain long in development during the course of the first season. Ellison, whose combative personality and controversies are just as well recognized as his highly influential contributions to science fiction, had numerous problems with Roddenberry and the rest of the staff behind the scenes at Star Trek. 
After numerous script rewrites by Ellison, who was also working on various other commitments that stalled its completion, Roddenberry was still dissatisfied. Years of discussion regarding the creation of City have revealed that Roddenberry, story editor Steve Carabazzos, story editor DC Fontana, and producer Gene L. Kuhn all took part in rewrites to some degree. However, Ellison's major story threads, characters, and themes remained throughout. When asked about his spark of inspiration for the episode, Ellison remarked years later, It was an image of two cities, which is what it says in the script. The city on the edge of forever is the city on this planet. It was not a big donut in my script. It was a city. That was a city that was on the edge of time, and it was where all the winds of time met. When you go through to the other side, here is this other city, which is also on the edge of forever, which is New York City during the Depression. It's the mirror image of each other. In that time, all I was concerned about was telling a love story, which I made the point that there are some loves that are so great that you would sacrifice your ship, your crew, your friends, your mother, all of time, everything in defense of this great love. That's what the story was all about. After traveling through the time gate, Kirk and Spock arrive in New York City in the year 1930 before McCoy's time-disrupting arrival, where they blend in as they wait to prevent catastrophe. The pair meet Edith Keeler, played by Joan Collins, a kind-hearted woman running the 21st Street mission, and Kirk soon falls in love with her, while Spock analyzes his tricoder's images to determine the cause of the time alteration. Of course, Ellison's story is a tragedy, and Spock eventually determines that Keeler must die for time to remain on course. Should she live due to McCoy saving her life from an accident, her anti-war efforts will keep the United States out of World War II for too long and lead to Nazi Germany conquering the world. For a show that values peace over war, this is an episode of Star Trek where pacifism is shown to have disastrous consequences. And like so many time travel stories, the course of human history is balanced on the smallest of moments. In weighing one's own personal well-being against the greater good, The City on the Edge of Forever plays into an idea that would define many future Star Trek installments. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. For all its epic ideas and bombastic science fiction, Star Trek is propelled by individuals who must make difficult decisions in the midst of ethical and societal dilemmas. But given that the crew of the Starship Enterprise faces new species, strange worlds, and every sort of sci-fi concept as they travel around the galaxy, modern real-world dilemmas can be heightened to a degree unreachable in a more grounded setting. I'm in love with Edith Keeler. Jim, Edith Keeler must die. And that's the beauty of science fiction, putting a slightly outlandish spin on a real-life issue so that writers can explore the concept to the furthest degree possible and allow viewers to explore different viewpoints they may typically be automatically opposed to hearing in everyday life. Sure, there's plenty of action, romance, and drama in Star Trek the original series and the many iterations that followed, but Star Trek is most interested in the decisions that lead up to a course of action and the consequences of such decisions, rather than just the action itself. This is right at the heart of Ellison's story. While the very fabric of time and history of the Earth is at stake, the city on the edge of forever is by and large focused on Kirk and Keeler's relationship, leading to the episode's tragic decision. Much of its second act is devoted to Kirk and Keeler growing closer through their shared worldviews, as Spock works to determine the fulcrum on which time is changed. But what adds to the tragedy is not simply allowing the death of a loved one, but in the loss of a kindred, futurist spirit. Despite being alive in 1930, Keeler has a heart and mind that belong in Star Trek's future. Man is going to be able to harness incredible energies, maybe even the atom. Energies that could ultimately hurl us to where the world in, in some sort of spaceship. It's that mentality that leads to Kirk falling in love with her, but is also the source of her character's tragic contradictions. Edith Keeler must not be alive to see such a future, for her continued life will be what prevents such a world from coming to be. The City on the Edge of Forever was not the first Star Trek episode to center on time travel, despite its placement in the first ever season of the franchise. The Naked Time and Tomorrow is Yesterday had already seen the Enterprise travel to the past, and it wouldn't be the last either, with time travel occurring in multiple episodes of every television series and a large number of the franchise's films. 
But it's Ellison's unique fingerprints and the story's tight focus on the personal toll of sacrifice for the greater good that set City apart, and also make it a major influence on the many time travel stories that came later. As a writer, Ellison's speculative fiction is largely pessimistic, driving toward ideas of doom and desolation when it comes to the current and future state of humanity. But Star Trek is a hopeful rumination on the future, with mankind's collaboration and world peace making space exploration possible. A lack of conflict between the crew of the Starship Enterprise was a mandate by Roddenberry, and would largely inform the original series, The Next Generation, and their related movies. This collision between Ellison's darker overtones and Roddenberry's message of hope were clearly the cause of the numerous rewrites of City, but is also a major reason behind its resonance with fans. With Kirk realizing that he is in love with Edith, just as Spock finally determines that it is her death that will restore time, personal devotion and the greater good collide within the heart of Captain Kirk. Save her. Do as your heart tells you to do. And millions will die who did not die before. Throw a newly arrived and slowly recovering bones into this explosive mix, and our heroes are left with an impending, horrifying decision. But just as Kirk and Spock reunite with McCoy, Edith's fate arrives. Fittingly, it's Kirk who must stop Bones from saving her, as it is he alone who has both the knowledge and emotional connection to make his decision possible. It's a collision of every emotion and sci-fi concept in a sudden, heartbreaking moment of inevitable tragedy. Taking place far away from the series' typical deep space setting, the loss and turmoil of the city on the edge of forever seem far more immediate and relatable, even when compared to Star Trek's typical focus on characters over science fiction concepts. By its end, history has been corrected and the universe has been restored. But at what cost? The toll of Edith's death on Kirk is clear, as demonstrated by his utterance of Let's get the hell out of here. One of the first ever occurrences of hell being used as a swear on television. And it's on this downbeat note that the episode ends, leaving viewers with a tinge of darkness that possibly outweighs the salvation at hand. After all, the time stream destruction and its many consequences are largely discussed rather than seen. Earth's not there, at least not the Earth we know. Yet Edith and Kirk's relationship is played out in front of the cameras. The heaviness of all of history being rewritten for the worse is easy to understand without needing to be shown. It's also much easier on the budget. The stakes are obvious. But it's the relationship, sacrifice, and loss that need to be illustrated in order to give the narrative its power, which is the focus of City by and large. As such, the moral obligations and victory of the Enterprise crew lean darker than usual for a TOS episode. It's this lingering, unexpected weight in a show that was known to explore serious issues, but with a consistent positivity that allowed the city on the edge of forever to remain in the minds of fans for generations, and echo throughout all of Star Trek as a whole. Ellison, who would go on to create numerous hallmark pieces of science fiction over the course of his 84 years of life, would remain forever linked to a franchise he had little to do with, and would largely remain contentious toward. Unsurprisingly, he saw the changes to his script as the worst sort of disrespect. The script does not end the way the episode does. Kirk goes for her to save her. At the final moment, by his actions, he says, F it. I don't care what happens to the ship, the future, and everything else. I can't let her die. I love her. And he starts for her. Spock, who is cold and logical, grabs him and holds him back, and she's hit by the truck. The TV ending, where he closes his eyes and lets her get hit by the truck, is absolutely bullshit. It destroys the core of what I tried to do. Having Kirk still attempt to save Edith despite the consequences is certainly a bold and emotional choice by Ellison, but it's not surprising that Roddenberry would want Kirk to make the hard decision. By and large, Kirk is committed to the greater good throughout Star Trek, and to have him try and save her would go against his typical characterization and Roddenberry's ideas as a whole. But Ellison, who threatened to be credited under his protest pseudonym of Cordwainer Bird, would also go on to win numerous awards for the episode. In its time, the city on the edge of forever would be met with massive critical acclaim and its reputation would only rise over the years, with Ellison publishing his original script for the episode and a detailed account of the events that surrounded it, further highlighting the production problems that led to its one-of-a-kind nature. But the power of the story as it first aired on April 6, 1967 remains. 
It's a testament to the strength of the story's unshakable, haunting narrative, the utterly unique voice of Ellison, and the forever fertile philosophical ground of Star Trek that a single episode of television would quickly become a monument in the landscape of science fiction. I could have saved her. Do you know what you just did? He knows, Doctor. He knows. Today, Harlan Ellison's The City on the Edge of Forever is a hallmark of the truly resonant, humanist vision of Star Trek.